Without further ado, we have one more session before we can get to more drinks, cocktails, snacks. Um, but it's a really important conversation for us to have, which is around the future of responsible AI ethics and regulation heading into 2024. Uh, and we have an absolute rock star panel to cap us off tonight. Uh, so I'm excited to invite to the stage Crystal Hugh from Reuters, our moderator, as well as George, Keith, Stephen, and Var. Come on out. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. We promise you'll get drinks after this. Uh, I'm Christo Hu. I cover AI and startups for Reuters and very excited to have a great panel uh, for our last session today we go, where we can talk about AI regulations and responsible AI. As you can see from their outfit, we have two people wearing ties and two not. So we will have a good, which means we'll have a good variety. <laughs> No, George represents the startup community, so it's fit that he didn't wear a tie. Uh, but we will go through the room, let us uh, have the opportunity to understand a little bit of everyone's uh, different background and the perspectives that we'll bring in the conversation and what they are seeing in terms of responsible AI in their respective field. So we'll start with you, George. Thanks, Crystal. I'm George Matthew. I'm a partner at uh, Insight, which is an investment management firm that does a lot of work in software from early stage venture to growth to buyouts. We have about 80 billion of assets under management. We're deploying out of a $20 billion fund 12. I happen to focus on all things related to data and AI from an investment standpoint, uh, where I've done investments in modern data stack, MLOps, LLMOps, generative AI. Some of my portfolio companies include weights and biases, which I think most everyone in this room should know. Astronomer, uh, purveyors of Airflow, led the Jasper round um, in generative AI sort of for marketers, and quite a few things in the observability space. Hi, I'm Keith Sonderling, a commissioner at the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and I'm the reason you're all afraid of implementing AI in the workplace. <laughs> but we're going to change that and talk about you know, regulations. And you know, I bring the perspective of actually being from Washington, D.C. and have to regulate this technology that's being invested in, used, and that the future technology as well. And we'll talk about how that really implicates a lot of uh, longstanding issues that we've been dealing with in Washington and at the EEOC. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Malone. I'm in-house counsel at Fox Corporation here in New York. I handle employment law and uh, executive compensation ESG initiatives. Um, I've done a lot of research and writing about um, the application of employment laws with respect to artificial intelligence. Um, happy to be here, and I hopefully will give you something interesting because I know it, we're the last thing before happy hour. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Var Shankar. I am the executive director of the Responsible AI Institute. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works with our corporate members to help them build their responsible AI capacity. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is by convening uh, the responsible AI community. So that includes policymakers, researchers, practitioners, uh, as well as academics. Um, and uh, so, you know, we've been in the responsible AI space for seven years. Uh, we have kind of a growing team. This year was obviously a, a big year for in terms of interest in responsible AI. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation. Yeah, thanks again for joining us. Um, and a lot of here, pe people here, we have our founders and people who are building companies in the technology space um, and who don't spend every time following, you know, every single bill that's been proposed or executive orders that may come out. So maybe Keith, you can maybe bring us up to date about the framework that you are seeing uh, in terms of AI regulation in the U.S. Yeah, you know, I think it's really, we're here on the one year anniversary of ChatGPT being launched. It's also the one year anniversary of most people in Washington, D.C. caring about AI or understanding what AI is. And, you know, um, and because it's ChatGPT you can use, you can play with, suddenly for uh, members of Congress, members of the Senate, they could play with it themselves. And more importantly, their constituents um, could use around uh, and play around with it. And then suddenly, 
it became the top news story. So then Washington begins to care about this. But I think that's a, a really big distraction, especially for the founders in the room um, who may be hesitant to engage in this area, invest in this area, buy in this area, or just be um, thought leaders in this area to be able to make new products, is that the, the chaos going on in Washington, D.C. about how to regulate AI, really worldwide, but if we need a new AI commission, if we new, need new AI laws, you know, that really makes you overlook the fact that what AI is doing, it's, do, it's making a decision. And in my case, it's making an employment decision. And, or in finance, it's making a credit decision. In housing, it's making a housing decision. Whatever use you want to use AI, it's making a decision. And those decisions have been made, being made since the beginning of time. And for us, you know, in employment, any type of employment decision has been regulated in the United States since 1964. And all you're doing is using technology to either help you augment it or completely make that decision. And there's longstanding principles for whatever industry you're in, in employment that's not having bias, not discriminating. So those laws exist. And whether or not Congress is going to make new laws or put new layers on there, that may happen. I mean, in Congress, they can't even pass a budget. So um, don't hold your breath. But don't be distracted by whatever industry you're in, you're in. There's principles regarding the use of whatever product you're making, whatever decision you're making. And that has been longstanding. And that's how you should build your programs around, not potential future regulations. So part of, sounds like part of your focus is we already have this agency who are already regulating the industry. Maybe we don't need a standalone agency to regulate specifically about AI. Yeah, I mean, the EUC regulates employment decisions. The FTC uh, regulates a lot, sometimes more than they should. The SEC as well with securities. Uh, HUD regulates housing decisions. So you really just need to say whatever product you want to develop, whatever industry you want to get into related to AI and technology, what is the governing body there? And you'll notice a lot of those laws existed long before computers and technologies, and that needs to be the basis of how you look to operate within the bounds of the laws and the ethical frameworks. And George, I know as an investor, you spend a lot of time looking at the implications for responsible AI for investment that maybe like ESG could be an emerging category as more companies have the need to be compliant with regulation and develop this technology safely. Can you uh, give us some examples how you view this area uh, from the safety lens? Right. Uh, so one aspect is what's already in place as far as software and inside of ESG, there's this notion of GRC software, governance, risk and compliance software, which has been around for a while in a similar way. And so what we're now starting to see is two things occur in the sort of governance, risk, compliance software side of the world. One is that the existing scaled out players, like we made an investment into a company called OneTrust, which is probably one of the leaders in that space, are now introducing capabilities in terms of what AI regulations can be captured inside of GRC software. The other that's happening is there's like some incredible startups that are doing work from the bottoms up to be able to say, as these regulations are layering upon themselves at a local state, federal, and global level, how do you reconcile all that and make real-time adjustments to regulations as they're occurring and understand how models are complying to those regulations? And so there's like a whole slew of like companies that are emerging that we've been following. I, I wrote a piece on this on just responsible AI with one of my associates uh, just a few months ago just to capture what's happening in this next generation category. On top of that, we've also been just making investments in just understanding better model observability, just being able to understand fairness and bias detection in terms of how models are coming into production. And that's an area that you know has been in market for a few years. And Insight made an investment in a company called Fiddler, which uh, literally does model observability. There's a few other players in that market. And they're now benefiting from the fact that um, there are more models, particularly LMs, fine-tuned, that are going into production. And as they're going into production, uh, you need better capacity to observe those LLMs. And uh, that's that's all here. Like the frameworks are here to do that today. And Steve, I want to bring your perspectives working out of Fortune 500, you know, sitting as an in-house counsel. Usually you are the last kind of line of defense when people are thinking about what AI technology to adopt or not. In your views, are you seeing any uh, concerns, risks, as well as opportunities? Sure, I'd be happy to address that. I think one concern in, in any large organization and, and where I work has 10,000 employees is that any particular uh, employee or manager might meet some vendor at a trade show or a conference and be convinced to 
to purchase some kind of uh, software application. Um, it, you know, and, and an organization adopting that kind of technology really needs to kick the tires on it to make sure that it's compliant from a data security and data privacy standpoint, for example, um, that being one risk. Um, you know, I, I think also as an organization, we've had to send out to our employees some cautions about using generative AI products and chat GPT. There's some concern that if employees put confidential information in to that system, the system will learn from it and adopt it and, and potentially provide that as a result to other users out there. And then our confidential information uh, goes out uh, in into the marketplace. Um, I think also we're, we're concerned about users using generative AI, for example, uh, receiving back results that might be copyrighted and then inadvertently using that, holding that out as their own content and violating copyright laws uh, inadvertently. Uh, and then something that I've talked often about with Commissioner Sonderling here is the risk of using some AI products with respect to recruitment and retention of um, the hiring of employees, right? I, th I, I think there are so many tremendous AI tools for the workplace in terms of uh, helping you recruit, um, reach out, ensure, uh, push for a diverse slate, have better recruiting. I actually think it's a terrific tool for fostering diversity. Um, there are some potential downsides, though, if that technology is not used properly. And so I think any organization before they adopt that really needs to kick the tires on that. On that point, I think using AI for kind of selecting the candidates in the screening process has been in place for a while. Uh, but in the past year, I think there is a huge kind of acceleration and adoption of this technology and more people are aware of the risks. Are you guys are seeing more like different um, like opportunities that may present in terms of the employment and recruiting process because of use of AI in the past year? Well, I think it's no longer a question, are you going to use this technology? I think we're way past that. And I think you have to be, especially for large corporations that get hundreds of thousands or millions of resumes a year. It's the question is, how are you going to use it? And how are you going to comply with the longstanding civil rights laws in this case relating to hiring? And a lot of it is how you frame it as well. You know, the more transparent you can be, you can actually use these software to take that skills-based approach, moving away from some of the longstanding biases that have been in the workforce, that have been within entering the workforce, that have been within getting promoted within the workforce, and actually have, if you do it properly, if the tools you're using are carefully designed and they're properly used, whether it's making sure that the data set, and in our case, in employment, that's just your applicant pool or your current employees, you know, is diverse and it's not going to just replicate and amplify the status quo, or is the tool designed to actually look for the proper characteristics to make a lawful skills-based hiring decision and not going to just be used to intentionally discriminate and scale more than one person can ever do. So a lot of it is not just on the benefits because there's so many benefits too. The risks are going to be there just like there are risks in any kind of hiring done through humans. Because if you look back, you know, we still in the last two years, we've collected over a billion dollars from employers for violating our laws. So humans haven't been doing it that great either. That's the reason my agency continues to exist. And you know, how do we now use technology to mitigate some of the harms that have been within these hiring processes? And I think technology, if it's transparent, if you could actually show how you're using the skills and, and the, on your workforce can really help us get there in a much more transparent place and to promote equal employment opportunity. And VAR, I know at Responsible AI Institute, you guys kind of served as this connecting tissue between the private sector and policymakers. Uh, what are you seeing from the recruiting and uh, like fair, just fair use of uh, AI technology that people are mostly concerned about? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, I'll add to what Commissioner Sonderling said about the executive order only applying. So it, it has the force of law, but it only applies to federal agencies. Uh, so it's not kind of like a, a broad law like the EU AI Act. So um, I think one way is the way that he mentioned, which is uh, it, it kind of gives guidance to executive agencies on how to enforce existing laws. Uh, so it's very powerful that way. Uh, I think the other way is uh, procurement. And so, you know, the U.S. federal government is uh, the biggest customer of, of all tech in the world, right? Um, and so it kind of, in, in any industry, it kind of sets the standard of what good looks like. Uh, and so that's, uh, I'd say, even more so than regulation and even more so than, than uh, kind of global developments. That's the main reason a lot of our members are looking to 
uh, NIST, which is supposed to be a non-regulatory technocratic agency. Uh, and the NIST AI RMF is kind of a great way to have like common vocabulary, common terms, uh, and to kind of build communities of practice around. Uh, now on the point of a workforce, I think there's two two big things that happened this year that that we're watching closely. Uh, one is the the what's happening in Hollywood with the writer's strike and then now the actor's strike. Um, and you know there are a lot of lessons there in terms of uh, you know what does this mean for collective bargaining? Is AI something that's a term of employment or is it something that's kind of a business decision? Uh, and you know how do you, do people own their digital likenesses? Uh, what is the impact on background actors and others others in the space? So uh, even though it's kind of like a special set of issues in Hollywood, it's something that all industries are kind of watching uh, as an early kind of as an early version of all the issues that are going to play out in other industries. Um, and then the second thing is there was a study by uh, um, I think Ethan, Ethan Mollick and BCG where they took 700 consultants and said, you know, let's monitor them and see see what impact generative AI has on their productivity. Uh, and uh, it kind of, it showed that output quality went up by forty percent. Uh, tasks were completed twenty five percent faster, uh, and that less experienced consultants saw the greatest gains. And this is all just out of the box. Like there was no. Uh, it's just like okay, use use ChatGPT instead of doing what you're ordinarily doing. Um, and so work. I'll, that forty percent gain was impressive because it was the lowest performers inside of BCG's organization that ended up performing as well as the highest performers in the organization. So this sort of shift that we're entering right now, from a productivity standpoint, like you know, if we're seeing like a twenty percent gain in productivity, I mean, that's like comparable to the introduction of the steam engine in the 1800s, right? It's like, I don't think we're really understanding how big this opportunity is in front of us right now. That, so that's exactly right. And and just, just to finish that point, I think that, um, you know, when organizations come to us and they're like, hey, how do we start thinking about this? We're kind of like, you should have been thinking about this a few years ago. <laughs> we're in a period of consequences. Uh, and obviously, you know, better, better to put guardrails in place now and, and to think through these issues now. Uh, but the organizations that have been doing digital well uh, for the past several years are already better positioned to to deal with these issues. Yeah, and to to that point, uh, we'll open up to a question soon. Uh, but one last question from me is um, the productivity gains. Apparently, I think a big uh, concern people have about adopting this technology is it will affect the people unevenly. Depends on their education background, their ability and, and, you know, kind of capacity to learn new skills. And we have been seeing kind of upscaling and training programs going on in the States uh, with in the form of a more of a partnership between the private and public sector. But we can debate how how well that has been working out. But with this new opportunity with AI, who bears the more responsibility to train uh, employees to make sure that their skills update? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Far. Uh, sure. So I think uh, it's there's a role for uh, the, primarily for the organizations that are employing people uh, to not look at this as something that is you know replaces employees, but something that uh, replaces tasks and increases the productivity of existing employees. Uh, so I think that's that's the first point. Uh, but then I think there's also are going to be eventually a role for government because we're kind of building on anxieties. Uh, there's already anxiety about you know offshoring that's happened over the last 20 25 years uh, about immigration and so this is kind of a third you know a third layer of of uh, anxiety and there's eventually going to be some sort of political uh, requirement to to address it Steve do you have any thoughts from the corporation's perspective sure I think um... Obviously, a corporation would want to uh, train their their folks on using this technology if it's going to improve the productivity for the organization and help its bottom line. Um, I mean, organiza most organizations are not philanthropic nonprofit uh, charities. Um, it, you know, and I think also we can't discount individual responsibility, right? All of us in our jobs and in our daily lives realize the world is changing, and and it is incumbent on individuals too. I think to take some responsibility and and 
learn to adapt to new technology. I mean, as a lawyer, I started using WordPerfect and I thought it was the end of the world when Microsoft Office came out <laughs> and they made me use that. And I, I and now, now, you know, I'm, I'm learning Google Docs, right? But, but I'm adjusting. And, and I think people are going to have to adjust like that to AI technology in the workplace. Uh, I look at it a little different saying, who's it going to impact the most? And it's going to impact uh, older workers who may not be as familiar with the technology to be able to use the technology and to be able to upskill and reskill uh, older workers is going to take more time. Same with disabled workers as well. And you, you mentioned it, anxiety. I think mental health is going to play a big issue in this as well, because the anxiety of now saying, well, I've been a lawyer my whole career. Now I need to be a prompt engineer and now, or I've been an accountant or whatever profession you're in. And now I need to train my replacement. My replacement is this robot. You know, that's going to lead to mental health issues in the workplace, which are already rising in conversation for another time. So that, you know, employers looking to implement this just from a productivity standpoint, we're not talking about completely displacing workers, which is already happening in a whole nother set of legal issues. But for your current workers to make it more effective, they have to be comfortable with the programs you're giving and it has to be applied uh, equally and not discriminate. So there are going to be classes of workers that you're going to need to spend more time scaling on them and spend more time and effort to ensure that it doesn't discriminate against those certain groups. Yeah, it, it's going to get really tricky for the next few years on this because there's some types of work which are just, as we even speak, are being eliminated, right? So I'll give you a good example of this. In a lot of business processing, out, business process outsourcing use cases, if you're moving a bit of either paper or, you know, data from point A to point B, like those jobs are, you know, being replaced by a generative model and a lot less people, right? And that's already happened. If you look at like the recent changes at Accenture and IBM, they went from organizations that had 6,000 people inside of a BPO center in the Philippines to 350 people in a generative model. That 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 ship has sailed uh, for that kind of work. But then uh, other kinds of work is actually quite fascinating. I mean, if you look at a radiologist today, I mean, there is I strain and them staring at screens for eight hours, right? And it turns out that there's a very highly functional copilot that's available in using a generative model, even before GPT-4, to be able to just do vision as a copilot to radiologists. And GPT-4 does it even better, right? So, um, so I think there are different ways that this sort of is going to look and feel adopted. My general sense is that the things that are more rote the things that are more manual in nature are likely going to get obliterated very quickly. And the things that require human reasoning, uh, as far as roles go, jobs go, will likely have a co-pilot for humanity. Co-pilot for humanity. Um, I like that. Um, on that, I have more questions, but I would love to give audience in the room to have a chance to answer, ask questions as well. Um, do we have any hands raising? Oh, we have one in the back. This is a good one from the virtual chat. <clears throat> um, AI assistance boost productivity. We saw that in the BCG study, but paradoxically, maybe also risk human de-skilling. Do you think there's a <clears throat> like a, a a risk of humans like losing their skills? I think we covered a little bit of that in the question that was just asked, right? So I, th I think it depends on the type of skill. And look, by the way, like, let's be clear, like, we need humans involved even in the models themselves, right? Because why are these, you know, models, transformers, LMs working as well as they are? Well, it's because there's human feedback loops built into, you know, how the models improve over time. And guess what? Like, if you remove humans out of the loop, and it's just a bunch of like, you know, AI based, you know, reinforcement learning, right? There's a pretty likely chance that model collapse occurs. <laughs> like you still need machines and humans to work very closely together for the foreseeable future. So I don't think this is somehow, you know, a question of, uh, you know, are humans necessary or not? I think humans are very, very much part of this uh, future. I, I just think that um, the things that you're doing are just going to be fundamentally different, and we just have to prepare for that. And that requires upscaling of the things that we previously have done. Any other questions? Oh. Hi, uh, Art Kleiner, uh, 
with the AI dilemma. Um, great book. Have, thank you. Um, have you talked about um, sort of regulating the assessment of people and the ways in which AI is going to address that or, or you know, sort of add to the productivity of giving ratings to people's performance? And is, does that need to be thought about or constrained in any way? Well, you know, appointment assessments have been around since the industrial uh, revolution. And, uh, you know, the EEOC has strict guidelines on ensuring that any type of assessment, normally when we wrote these regulations in the 1970s, we're on with the pencil and Scantron, you know, we're relevant to the job. And I think the issue now is bring back nightmares. But the, I think the issue now is that these, you know, these tools, these AI tools are just making them so accessible and they're democratizing them, not just for your C-suite who normally were getting these, you know, very high level assessments, but now they can go to your hourly workers anywhere in the country on, on the phone. And the issues there is if you're using one test that normally had a lot of relevancy, you know, really validated by industrial and organizational psychologists in the C-suite, you know, to a cashier at a grocery store. Um, you know, to see if they can enter employment, you're going to, you know, have a lot of issues and it's going to have a disparate impact about against certain groups because you're not going to be able to validate it saying that this is, this test is showing a skill necessary for here. So some of the caution and, you know, there's a lot of vendors out there that are really narrowly tailoring these to different positions is in the buying side of this, you know, we're where you have to deal with is ensuring that's okay. You have this tool that's going to do these really great things. And it's going to help us, you know, be able to do assessments, move away from um, resumes or whatever the pitch is, but how is it going to be tailored to that position in that part of the country, which may have different requirements um, than, it, than another position somewhere else? Because if you use that one, there's no one size fit all approach because that's going to lead to discrimination. Yeah, I, I think um, tools that could be used to assess employees' so-called productivity, there are definitely risks like he was mentioning. I mean, there are... Um, for example, groups of employees who may have a disability or, or uh, and, and therefore would perform differently. And if you're just assessing them purely with a machine and not taking that disability into account, they might get poorer marks because of that. Uh, and that needs to be considered. Or, you know, something as simple as a machine that's measuring the time that somebody spends sitting at their workstation. Um, if they get up and they take a, a, a something work related to the kitchen to read, they're, they're, they're not considered at their desk, right? And so an employer might say, oh, I'm not going to pay them for that time because they're not working when in fact they are working. So there's all kinds of legal considerations in that regard too, where an employer could get in hot water, whether it's uh, not accommodating somebody with a disability, not properly paying wages to somebody uh, because of the use of the te technology. But you know, it, uh, other employers would say it's terrific. We can monitor safety and we can make sure that our drivers are not trying to get a pizza to you at 150 miles an hour, that they're not picking up a box the wrong way and straining their back. And so, so, you know, I, I think a lot of it even is in the language, right? Is this, is this remote surveillance or is this safety monitoring? Good points. I, I remember today I was just looking at my, uh, box at work day for a year and review, which I do hope there, there was like a generative AI bottom to create my year and re review that will say nice thing about my work. Uh, so maybe there will be uses of AI. Um, any other if questions? If it doesn't, let me know. <laughs> for sure. Any questions? Um, oh, I think we have one in the very back. Keith, you had uh, <clears throat> mentioned, you know, the need for transparency for employers that are using AI tools. And I, I think my question is really how employers can meet that obligation when they're not making the tools themselves. And so there's a limitation in terms of the amount of transparency that they can provide when the tools are developed by software developers who have a lot of reasons why they don't want to give real insight into how those tools work because it's proprietary. It's, you know, it's trade secret to them. And so it's a difficult quandary to put on employers to say, hey, you need to explain how the tool works or you need to let people know how it's being used when the employer is probably ill-suited to really explain how the tool works because they don't know. And this is the big issue because from a law enforcement standpoint, from a judicial standpoint, it doesn't matter 
if you are making a tool, if the tool is making the decision, or like I said before, a human's making the decision. All we have jurisdiction over in employment law are three groups, employers, unions, and staffing agencies. And that's it. We don't have the jurisdiction over these vendors as we, we do as employers themselves, to the extent they're using these tools on their own employees. So, you know, what's difficult here and where the top vendors sort of will rise in this industry is the ones that are going to be willing to work individually with the company being used it and not just say, well, here's an assessment in the aggregate. You know, here's how it works well with other clients or just this generic data that we purchased. Here's how it works on your exact location, this exact job description, which is going to be different than the next job description. And that is a really tedious process. And that is something what employers who are buying these tools need to essentially demand from the vendor say, you know, to the extent, yes, there is some proprietary information and we understand that, but the, the data set is not going to be pri proprietary. And what you input into the algorithm of what you're looking for, for the best candidate, which only you and your organization can know, you know, you can't rely if you're at one tech company, you know, the law is not going to allow you to lie and say, well, this is what this other tech company is doing. So we should be doing that because you may be instituting a lot of biases from that company into your own organization. So it's going to be a really back and forth process um, with the vendors where, you know, these are not just off the shelf products where these have to be really narrowly tailored to the specific use in that organization. And it, it, from the buyer's perspective, from the company's perspective, it's a lot of back and forth during the selling stage saying, well, how are you going to test it on my, um, on my company? And how are you going to do it as the, as our, you know, applicant or as our uh, workforce demographics change? How, is, how are you going to help us when the actual um, skills we're looking for um, change as well? And, and that is really where the rubber is going to meet the road with this, where the vendors are really going to have to spend an extra time and effort. And I know that's a little different than how SaaS software is sold. And But but the difference is when you're using it in the workforce, you're dealing with some of the most fundamental civil rights we have, which is the ability to thrive and enter in the workforce and not be discriminated against. So I, I don't want to say, you know, people like to categorize employment like they're doing in the EU is high risk. I don't believe in any of that, you know, because there's a lot of risk no matter what you're doing. It's a, it's just an extra care and extra governance that needs to go around it, um, both at the sales stage and then when you're using it yourself, continue to work with that vendor to get to that point where you feel comfortable that you have the records, you know, extracting whatever IP data they may have, that if you are faced with an investigation, you can show either the judge, the class action lawyers or the regulators what you did and how your decisions were lawful and how the results were lawful. That's a good takeaway, which is buy compliant <laughs> software and also ask questions when, especially when it comes to HR and employment issues. Uh, I think on that note, we will wrap from here. Thanks again for uh, thoughtful questions and I'll let you guys enjoy drinks. And thanks again, Var, Steve, and Keith for joining us for the great panel.